Hello again. Welcome back to Mapping Hour. This is episode 20. Remember that you'll need to log in to try some of these activities that you see. And where have we been? Just a quick reminder. Hours one through five, the fundamentals. Hours six through 10, expanding the ArcGIS Online framework. Hours 11 through 15, expanding further with a whole bank of apps. And 16 through 20, focusing on story maps, projects, design, and some favorites. Last couple times, we had projects by Charlie, Kylie, Joseph, and Tom. And what we get to do in this episode is all of the favorite things that we all have that we've not had time to explore in this 20-hour bonanza. So everybody gets one technical thing and one non-technical thing, and then the variations that everybody is going to throw in there as well. We're going to start off with Kylie. And Kylie, take it away. Thanks, Charlie. Well, I'm really glad we got to do this because one of the hardest things for me in mapping hour was choosing what we included and didn't because there's so many good things and we do have all these different interests and passions. So I'm showing exactly the map I, we looked at yesterday for my project. And that makes sense, right? Because my favorite thing I probably use in my fun projects. So in this case, the thing that I want to talk about first is called arcade. And I did mention this yesterday. And I'm going to first show an example and then I'll talk a little bit about what it is. So when I come in here to my map, I can go to the symbology on a layer and I can choose, as we've seen a number of times, different attributes to use for my symbology. But there's this other option of a new expression and that's where you're gonna get into Arcade. And I'm gonna jump to a layer where I've set one up. And now you can see I have an expression of Kylie, someone, no one, and I'm gonna edit that so you can see what it looks like. And you can see it, what I did is I wrote some code and I can test that expression and I can see what the first result in my database, the result that I'm gonna get from running this expression. Now what's powerful here is that I'm doing calculations with layer fields and I can use that result in various places in ArcGIS and that includes in labeling, in symbology as I'm doing here and with pop-ups. So I took data and I was able to manipulate it a bit before using it, yet I didn't have to add it into my table. I don't have to store more information. So that's pretty powerful. And so what I wanna do now is just jump to some examples to show you why this is really cool. One thing to remember, this is a language that is an expression language. It's made for math calculations. It does logical stuff, greater than, less than, equal to. And what's especially um, unique about Arcade is that it also does some geometry functions. So that gives it some power in this ArcGIS world. But what it isn't is a full automation language. I'm not going to use Arcade, for example, automation. If I have to do the same thing multiple times, I could write a script. Some of these terms may be familiar, but you would use a language like Python for that, a notebook. And Tom's going to come back to that in a minute because we have some overlapping interests. But just keep in mind what it is and what it isn't. So this is for more simple calculations. For example, if you have units in your data, maybe you've stored meters, but you want to display something in miles, things like that. Now I'm gonna show you a series of resources that I'm gonna include um, links to uh, through our website. So you can go review these on your own. But if I was gonna get started with Arcade, this is where I would start. It's a great story map that talks about Arcade and how you can use it, what it is, and some examples. And it even shows you what you need to do. You saw that just a minute ago, clicking that new expression option, right? And it looks at different fun features and how you use these different items to, in Arcade and create great maps with it. So another resource for you is this one, which takes it a little bit farther. It actually links to that story map we were just looking at. And in here you see examples of, okay, what can I do with labels? All right, what about converting units, like I just mentioned a minute ago? Just these really good examples, creating categories from numbers, all these different things that Arcade's gonna bring to life in your maps, okay? And you can take it even farther. With Arcade, you can actually now reference data from layers that you don't put in your map. For example, I want to enrich my map a little bit by showing maybe some population information, but I didn't want to include that living atlas layer in my map. Well, now I can call out and bring some of that in without 
making the map busier by just adding that information, maybe in the pop-up or in a side note that I want to make or a way I want to affect my symbology. So that's really powerful because as we've seen, maps can get really complicated and we want to keep it nice and simple. Now, I've, I've talked a little bit about how one of the things with Arcade is that it is not uh, Python. And so with that, that doesn't mean it's not powerful. And so the last example I want to show you is actually an example from field operations. And in this case, it was done for collector, where you could use Arcade to actually, in the field, calculate the materials you need to create a sandbag wall. Okay, so that's not simple coding, right? There are some complex equations and processes in there. And in fact, this blog, one of my favorite things, and I happen to know because I got to help set it up, is that we actually found a way to include that code for you right here in line with a nice look and feel. So this is another fun blog to read. And what it actually does is it looks at different ways of creating sandbag walls. Like there's different structures like a dike wall or different um, construction you can use to make them and looks at how you might calculate these differences, rounding all of this information and through it in the end, you actually end up getting the number of how many sandbags do I need to create a sandbag wall for this block that I just walked on the street or for this retaining wall that's breaking down, right? So yes, it's not automation. It's not full geoprocessing and analytics. But it can still do a little bit of heavy lifting here, which is pretty cool. Now, as, a, as an educator, one of the things I think is really powerful about Arcade comes back to what we were talking about yesterday when we said that you need to find things that people are interested in and passionate about, and that's when they're really gonna, going to relate to what you're teaching them, right? One of the things with Arcade is it's going to take those students who like to code, who like logical thinking, who want to play with the numbers, and kind of give them a home here, right? It's, it's a way that you can explore data through code. So you're actually working with the database, pulling information out of it, manipulating it, applying it as symbology, as a label, in a pop-up, but you're doing it through the lens of code. And for some students, me included when I was in school, that was a very powerful lens and just very engaging. It also is something that makes them feel a little bit included in a different way here, right? This is something they can bring to the table that maybe other students in the class aren't interested in or don't have experience in and aren't interested in learning about. All right, so that's Arcade. Check it out and play with it and see what it could do for your maps and your projects or maybe think of the student that you're going to be able to reach through this tool. Now, the less techie thing I want to talk about um, goes to one of the hats I wore recently at Esri, which is our product documentation and our resource pages. So every product or most at, that Esri offers has these resource pages. And it's kind of your one-stop shop for help about the different products. For example, I have the one for ArcGIS Online here, and there's equivalent ones for a number of products. And what is on here is information that is going to make you successful using that product. So through Mapping Hour, you may have been able to identify, for example, I want to do a project and it's going to use ArcGIS Online and Survey123 and Story Maps and a dashboard. And I start to do those things. And I get a little bit stuck because really we've only had 20 hours. And as much as 20 hours seems big for the number of things we've covered, it's not actually that large. So we haven't given you every detail on how to do everything in each of those tools. Well, these resources pages are going to be where you get that next piece of information. So what I have here is the ArcGIS Online one, and they're slightly different product to product, but similar enough that they will feel familiar. So in here, the first thing that ArcGIS Online does is links you to some content over in Learn. Now we've talked about Learn as a resource, and this is kind of the curated set of items from Learn that ArcGIS Online and the team that works on that product thinks will make you really successful with their product. Okay, so you get to see some things from Learn. You get to see what's new. As we've talked about, this software is changing all the time. If you watch these episodes in a month, in two months, in three months, it will be different. Okay, but you can come in here and get that snapshot of what's changed recently that will help you be successful and see maybe what's new that enables a type of project you hadn't been able to do before. 
You can also get to the ArcGIS blog, which is where some of these other items I showed earlier actually were written. It's where the product teams actually write examples and tips and tricks and share them with you. Okay, it also has, um, here again, more blog articles and the documentation. Now, product documentation is where you go when you know what you're working with and you know what you're trying to do, but you can't do it. Okay, so you have a little bit of language in which to ask your question, and this is where you can go to get your answer. Now, you can access it by scrolling down in the page or way back at the top, and it actually continues with us throughout the page. There's this navigation up at the top, home, get started, create, analyze, share. Now, these tabs, what comes after home will be different for the different products, but what that is, it actually jumps you right into the product documentation. For example, if you're working on maps and creating them, you can come right into this create area and learn about creating maps. Oh yeah, I know I need to choose a base map. Well, because I watched Mapping Hour, I have the vocabulary and language to say it's a base map that I need. And in here, I can come in, and if I don't remember, see the actual steps. Okay, I'm going to click that base map. Now I can click a thumbnail. Here's the information I can get. Okay, so just remember, after Mapping Hour, you have the basis of what you want to do, and you get stuck. Check out the resource pages. All right, those are my two things. I'm going to hand it now. It's going to go over to Joseph so we can look at his favorites. Thank you, Kylie. Sometimes the simplest things in GIS are so incredibly wonderful and powerful. So I've chosen using photos with locations in teaching. Let's say you've got a field experience. You've gone on a field trip with students or you've just gone on your own field trip and you've got a series of photographs and you wanna put those in a map. Now there's a variety of ways to do that, but the simplest way is the one I'm gonna feature right here. And that is using the photos with locations tool. Now I've got this document that walks you through the whole process. It's a GeoNet essay of mine, and it'll be linked to episode 20 in the mapping hour zone. Let's just walk through how you would do this. Inside my ArcGIS online organizational account, I've got as you know from the mapping hour videos, add item. Add item from my computer. My item is in my case, a zipped file of photographs. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose this zip file. It contains basically the photo thumbnails that you see here. The full size photos of course are in this zip file. So if I add that zip file to this, what is it? It's not a shape file, it's not some of these other things. What it is, it's photos with locations. Pretty evident right from here. You don't even necessarily need to read every single sentence of my, of my uh, procedures, but I've got it all documented there. Photos with locations. What does that do? Well, in the interest of time, I'll show you the results. Okay, so you add that, then that becomes what I'm gonna show next. What that is, is the following. It, as you would expect, it's got a point for every single photo. Now. I've got it very focused on a certain field trip that I took last summer that I'm really excited about to show you, and that is right here. The default colors, symbols, you know you can change those from the mapping hour video, so this is what it comes in as a default. I can click on one of these. They're all geotagged. They're all located, therefore, on my map. So within 30 seconds, I've got a map of my photo locations. Now, why is that powerful? Well, for example, I can go, ah, let me just have a moment. Lake City, Colorado. That looks like Switzerland, doesn't it? But it's Southwest Colorado. But I've got a, a very easy to use method here of quickly mapping my photographs. Now, what if your photographs aren't geotagged? Maybe they're old photographs or maybe your location services weren't on on the, on the, on the day that you took the photos? Well, Actually, uh, Tom Baker told me about this uh, not, uh, oh gosh, it was like 10 years ago, huh, Tom? Uh, GeoImager is, is one way where you can actually geotag your photographs. And there are other methods too, but I've, I've come back to this, Tom, many times over the past decade. So that's, that's one thing. If you don't have the locations on your photos, you can put the locations on your photos. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is the following. Let's say it, th there are several advantages of using this method. Uh, first of all, the photos are stored in ArcGIS Online, so there's no need to actually go to this blog of mine that talks about, hey, if you've got photos in Google Photos or Dropbox or Flickr, 
those are still okay, but those those photo platforms change so often. And the nice thing about this method is that the photos are actually stored. Remember Kylie and I think all of us at some point mentioned a feature service. These photos are a feature service and then you can use that in other tools. You could use it in ArcGIS Pro. You could do things with it. You could analyze. You could, you could get a sense of the clustering, for example, of the feature service. So that's a nice thing about this. You don't have to use Flickr and so on and so forth. And the last, well, a couple of other advantages, you could also use them in a story map. And the pop-ups, as you can see, are automatically configured. And, ooh, I could make a 3D scene out of those, right? So, okay, there's that photograph that you just saw. And now since this is a mountainous area, this is really fascinating to be able to make my 3D scene. You know how to use, how to create these in a 3D scene. You just simply add that feature service into your 3D scene and you're good to go. And probably the most, the best advantage of all is that the whole process takes literally a minute to grab those, that zip photo archive and put it into a map and then I'm good to go. The other thing that I wanted to mention was that extending this just a little bit deeper. What if I wanted the photos to actually be like this, actually embedded in the pop-up? Well, connecting to what Kylie was saying, in this set of procedures, Arcade is, is our magic ticket, to, our golden ticket to doing that. In this case, it's a six line expression. What it does is it calculates an attachment ID. Remember these photos are stored as attachments in ArcGIS Online. It calculates the ID and then it configures the pop-up to display that URL inside the pop-up as an image. So it's a nice way for you to sort of dip into a little bit of an arcade uh, set of, of code there. Six lines is all, and this is the result as you just saw. One more thing to say about that, um, I would just give this a try. Um, but the last thing to say about this is that there's more to come. Kylie referred to this, that these tools are evolving in the new map viewer that's now in beta, but maybe by the time you see this, summer 2020, it will be, or some point in later 2020, it will be actually part of the platform uh, and out of beta. But inside the, the new map viewer beta, pop-ups have been improved in many ways. And some of them directly relate to what I'm talking about right now. In this beta release, you'll see a decent sized thumbnail for every one of my points that I just dragged in from the photos with locations tool. The default mode is list, which shows a tiny thumbnail, but if you use attachments and uncheck show as list and convert them to a gallery mode, it shows it right here. No coding required. So again, um, it shows the evolution of the tools. All right, those that that's my techie, not too techie, but I love this, this tool. The last one that I wanted to show is if you go to the tapestry page, we've talked about tapestry segmentation several times because we all love it and hopefully you will too. Uh, if you go to the, just search on Esri tapestry, you'll see this and there's a tab called zip lookup. I just wanted to remind you that this zip lookup was there because let's say you have five minutes with your principal, with your dean, your department head, whoever you're working with in your educational institution or with a set of, of parents, um, et cetera and you wanna show the power of GIS. This to me is one of those tools that I would show if I only had five minutes or only 10 minutes. You see what I mean? Because it's just so powerful and so engaging and people are like, I wanna look at where I grew up. I wanna look at where I live now. And so this zip lookup, I've got uh, this centered on our office in Louisville, Colorado. And just as a reminder, when you search on a zip code, you have the option of changing the variables. So all of these are configurable um, in terms of selecting different variables to look at. You get a, se a set of graphs and so on and so forth. You can read more about that neighborhood and you can have discussions about, well, does that fit you, your neighbors? Does it fit your overall neighborhood? How well does it fit? What's the difference between individuals and, and a, um, a aggregation, for example, zip codes? And in this particular one, as you can see here on the left side, it's, it's a mixture really of these segmentation types and their behaviors. So the, that is the, the zip code lookup tool. One last thing about the zip code lookup tool that I don't think we mentioned before, and that is under this success stories tab, 
this is really a, a nice addition to your discussion and your demonstration and your work with students with the zip code lookup tool. And the reason why I like this is because it shows that this isn't just interesting, it's not just a good instructional resource, but people are actually using this in industry, for example, for Wendy's, okay? Why are they using this? So you can get into, yeah, you're using this tool in the context of education and you're learning about biomes and the Dust Bowl and all the other wonderful things we've been doing here in the mapping hour, but giving the students a sense that this tool is actually being used in government, industry, nonprofits, academia, and so on to, as Charlie keeps saying, build a better world. That to me is the power of these stories. There's not that many of them, but they're very focused and I think full of wonderful information. So that's my two things, folks. I've got the, the photos with locations tool and the zip code lookup tool. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. Thanks. Joseph, that's great. I love both of those. Um, and to your, to your uh, concluding points about the use of uh, geospatial tools in careers, uh, I want to show folks two examples of things that I think are related to that very point. Uh, that idea of being able to engage a GIS or even geospatial thinking to help enable or empower careers. And it's not just the careers of uh, the GIS analyst, for example, or the cartographer um, that we might commonly think of, but it's a lot of these so-called geo-enabled careers where people are using GIS to analyze data, small data, big data. Um, some examples that I've got on screen here are produced in conjunction with an organization called uh, Virtual Job Shadow. I've included this link off of the Mapping Hour homepage. You can just do a search for it, uh, do a search for careers, and you'll find the link to this. Uh, these folks have been working with us for over a decade to make various, what I would call our geo-enabled careers in many cases, but we do have some more traditional career focuses here. So each of these is a video that lets a student or a young learner follow an actual professional during a day in their job. So I don't want to just show one of these over our Zoom uh, recording system. I think it might bog it down. But for example, we can take a quick look at this uh, GIS developer slash uh, uh, drone uh, video. And it's not just the video, but I would encourage you to come back and look at those. It's some additional information about that career type. So it's a Q&A is included, a description about the career um, of course, required education and then earnings, earnings potential, at least starting out. So maybe you are teaching with GIS, maybe you're teaching about GIS, maybe you're learning it at home over this extended period where we're out of uh, formal classrooms. Check these things out because, you know, it's everything from uh, foresters to uh, data managers to conservationists to climatologists to agriculturalists, volcanologists, it's all over the place. It's a great collection of videos. And uh, certainly if, if you uh, are, for example, a career and technical ed educator, it's a great resource to, um, to have at your disposal. So again, that's the uh, Virtual Job Shadow uh, Career Video Collection, and it's available from the Mapping Hour homepage. So that was a non-technical resource I wanted to share with you. The technical resource that I want to share with you is, as Kylie mentioned, is actually our Python tools. And I want to focus on um, what's called the, the ArcGIS um, uh, Python API. And this particular tool set allows us to do things like create maps, uh, run analytics, uh, or um, manage GIS systems. So for educators who are, for example, managing their school's ArcGIS online organization, these tools can be equally useful for um, keeping your organization clean and tidy as well as running efficiently. So I've got three demo scripts uh, that I want to share with you. I've shared these scripts as well to the Mapping Hour homepage. So if you do a search in the homepage or do a search in the Mapping Hour group, 
you'll, uh, you'll find some of these examples. So uh, the first one I'm going to do is kind of a fun script. And you might have noticed on my web browser, it may look just a little different from yours. This is the K-12 organization, and I'm logged in as an administrator. Now, our temporary mapping error accounts are all publisher level accounts, so they're kind of one step down. Administrator accounts right now in this organization have an extra link at the top that says notebook on it. Now, you may have notebooks in your organization. Um, if you have an account with another ArcGIS Online organization, reach out to your administrator and ask them to turn on notebooks for your account if you're interested in looking at some of these exercises, okay? So uh, this is brand new, by the way, uh, for Esri. This notebook uh, tool set for Python is in beta, and I believe it's just been, geez, like within the last month or so that it's, it's been added. So we are, we're, we're looking at the, the cutting edge here. Notebooks, Jupyter Notebooks and Python is actually a, a quite extensive of an environment and it has a, a fairly extensive legacy. So the system and the ideas um, extend back uh, and touch numerous organizations. Um, it's just that it's recently been implemented inside of ArcGIS Online. So we're gonna go ahead and open this notebook. And as you can tell, it's called Bases of GIS. I tried to keep these scripts as simple as possible. And the idea being that I'm not gonna teach you Python, obviously, in, in the four minutes or so that I have remaining. But I want you to see how Python falls into these little cell blocks, and then we hit these run buttons, and they can execute a line of code. So this little script here actually looks at the K-12 organization, and based on the usernames that I previously entered, it will pull back the, the profile data each of the four instructors in the mapping hour has available inside. So through this Python scripting environment, we can generate text, we can generate graphics, we can generate three-dimensional uh, interactive graphics and images. Um, we'll show you some more of those in a moment. So this is an example of how you can use Python inside these notebooks to do a little bit of system maintenance. Maybe you want to query back the members of a group and have them automatically output. Um, that kind of thing is, is quite possible. So let me show you one other administrative sort of function that we can do. I think maybe one that Charlie will find interesting. This little script, um, we're going to open it in our notebooks again. This little script actually counts the number of, of, of files in your ArcGIS Online organization that has the word test in the title. So, you know, when you're making a map and you're doing it fast and you know you're not going to do anything profound with it, you just want to see if something works. Sometimes, at least I, and I know Joseph does, um, will put the word test in the title. It's a it's reminder to us that we probably later should go back and delete it because it's, you know, it's just an experiment, just a test, a dry run at something. So this little script, you can tell on, let's see, about, eh, about here, we're going to actually query our organization and look for things that have the word test in the title. And we're gonna cap it at a thousand items at return. And then you can tell by the print line below that, it looks like we're gonna probably count up the number of items. And then below that, we're gonna do some sort of print or output statement for each item, or at least we're gonna to try to. So I'm gonna hit run on our little snazzy code block. And sure enough, public items inside the K-12 organization right now, there are two that have the word test in the title and they're actually publicly shared. The cool thing about this script and several others like it is if I pass my credentials along with the script, it would actually, my credentials would be up here, it will search items that are shared either publicly, organizationally, or even are private to the owner. So I could do an exhaustive uh, search based on title at all of the various test-based content that's in my org. It's a great way to clean up your organizational accounts, say at the end of the school year, or maybe at the beginning of the school year when you're getting ready to, to roll things over. Now, I didn't build it out, but what one might do then is, of course, add some delete capacity to, since we've identified those objects, go in and actually automatically delete that content, or maybe corral it into one location. All that's possible. Through, uh, through Python. So the last script I wanna show you in the remaining minute it looks like I have 
is uh, one where we actually build a map. Now you might be thinking, why would we, you know, why are we gonna use Python to build a map? Because it's so easy to build it through the map viewer. And it truly is. If you're doing a one-off map, or if you don't want to code or not interested in programming, um, this probably isn't the direction you need to go. However, if you have maps that you need to auto-generate, or you've got some data that you've got to crunch, some analytics you've got to process as a part of making your map, you can do all that work and more by using the Python API. So I've got three active or three code blocks in this sample. Uh, we can take a quick look at it. Basically, the first code block is going to make a map for us. I'm going to go ahead and hit the run button on the first code block, and sure enough, it's drawn my map. I'm going to scroll up a little bit. I can zoom and pan, and that's kind of cool. And I've also got a 2D, 3D flip in here, so I can turn on my, my three-dimensional globe. And again, it's still active. I can still zoom and pan. Now, that's pretty slick. Uh, I'm going to go down to my next code block, which is almost scrolled off my page. I'm going to make it active and hit the run button. And I'm going to drag in one of Charlie's previously generated USA enrichment layers. So that was a layer that he already had sitting in our K-12 organization. And you can tell that I identified it down here. It says enrich, uh, yeah, USA states. And it tells what kind of items I want to restrict my type to. And my maximum, and all I did was add it to my map. So of course, it's it's interactive. I clicked on California, for example, and I've got my, my cool info pop-up, right? So one last little thing to show you here. Yeah, you can add data to the map. And then um, I've got one other little data layer. I clicked my third box, made it active. And yes, I'm going to pull in a, a point uh, set of data. And those are, of course, our, um, are the office locations of our instructors. And uh, I missed it. I clicked on Virginia and not Charlie's icon. So we've got Kylie in the West, Joseph in the mountains, Tom's in the Midwest, and Charlie's on the East Coast. So those are three cool things you can do with Python. All the sample code and a whole lot more is available at the Python, uh, the ArcGIS uh, API for Python homepage, which uh, will be included also uh, in a link from the, um, from the Mapping Hour uh, site. So with that, I'll turn it over to Charlie. Wow. Okay, this is I'm I'm the slug here. Kylie was doing arcade. Joseph was doing some arcade stuff. Tom was doing Python. I'm not going to do any programming at all. But boy, do I want to learn when I get some time. Tom left just a, a little bit of time that uh, I can show. Hey, you know, here we are in the K12 org, which is the place that is the home to the mapping hour. So I've just, you know, the mapping hour lives inside the K-12 org. And so it's, it's just a way that you can kind of move back and forth. And over here in the video bonanza, and, and this is just an extra, so don't, don't count my time yet. Uh, I just wanted to say that, hey, here's where you can go in and say, I want to get to those uh, career videos as well, Tom. So this, I don't know if this is how you got there, but uh, it's the way I always get there when I want to watch one of these videos. Okay, now, now, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about one of my favorite tools and, and toys, and that is a little piece of software that I get to run on my phone. Now, my phone is plugged in here, so I'm going to stop sharing. Sharing. Ha! Yay! All right, Success. here we go. I need to go to my phone. Now, I'm one of these organized people that just says, I, I just live in groups. So I've got my group of Esri apps, and inside the Esri apps, I have two that I would really like to sp you know, spend my five minutes, so I, I, I whatever. Uh, one is ArcGIS Earth, and it gives you a nice, nice little uh, 3D thing here. So that's not the one that I wanted to share there. What I, what I really wanted to share is Explorer. So here's Explorer, and I am not signed in. So uh, it says, I'm, you know, it's giving me the sign in here. So I'm not signed in. 
But uh, if I just said, yeah, I wanted to uh, look at a map. So here's the colored pencil base map. And uh, there's me, the dot. And so I like this because wherever I go, I've got an atlas with me, a digital atlas. So think about all of the different base maps. So that if I'm sitting here in this one, and I just said, hey, are there any, any layers that I want to work with here? I could draw on the map. And you know, I've, I've been interviewing some people at some point at, at a dinner and say, so just, just draw in here. Where, where were you? Uh, you were just right in there, somewhere in there, that zone. Ah, OK, done. OK, well, the other thing is that what any map that you're thinking about Let's see, Tom and I were working with the uh, Kansas and Missouri map search. And um, ha, look at that, right in the center. There she blows. And oh, there's a layer that it says, I can't view one of the layers. So I had brought in a, oh, I guess it was the US state boundaries layer that was a living atlas layer. And because I'm not signed in, and it says you need to be signed in in order to use that layer, I don't have that layer. But wait a second, does this mean that I can turn this uh, counties layer off or turn it back on? I can go in and explore and play with this and zoom in and say, hey, What's uh, what's that county? Geez, Tom, which is your county here? It's one of those counties. I know it's one of those blue counties that mm -hmm. I that I grabbed there. Well, this is I I really like this because this gives me the chance to explore and work with maps. And you know, there's another set of maps that I really love in here, and. It starts G E O I N Q U I Geo Inquiries. Look at all the geo inquiries that I can open up here. Geo inquiries search. And uh, I want to go see, let's see, there's the Beagle's Path, there's Borders, there's Westward Ho, there's Tropical Storm. Look at all of these. Anybody who is just working on a phone and all they have, oh, I love this river runs through it one. This is a great one. I like this because this one has um, the watersheds, this one, the, the US watershed boundaries. That's the one that I, I just kept missing. And um, here we've got the, uh, remember where Charlie's, uh, Charlie's fishing hole is? It's uh, right up in here on uh, what is that that uh, that that particular watershed the St. Croix River yeah i can follow this i can get access to any of the geo inquiries on my on my phone and that's i really like that i like that being able to do that okay so stop sharing my screen here all right there we go so the other one that I want to do, I'm going to go back to uh, my computer now and share my screen. Oh, so that was Explorer for ArcGIS. Incidentally, you can find that for your uh, iOS device, your Android device, and also Windows 10. And my Chromebook actually works with Explorer because it is able to uh, install an Android app. Oh, and then there's this other one that I was uh, not supposed to show there that I, I like as well. The other place that I want to take you to is a place that is a favorite of mine because there are really important places to go and see, and that's GeoNet. GeoNet is, it's like Facebook for GeoGeeks. This is the place that you can find all kinds of things. And when you are signed in, GeoNet, and I've set it up to go to my uh, inbox. Nobody had sent me any messages. And, and that's where I go then to say, 
where are all the places that I want to take a look at? Where are the places that you want to go? And so you can just jump into the education space. And this is a place where there's all kinds of information for higher ed and K-12 ed. And uh, there are featured elements, there are events. So I over here, I'm gonna go over to the K-12 instruction zone. So here's a group that is all kinds of information here that is featured content, related places, there are uh, a lot of people that follow these things and post questions. And uh, this is where we post our blogs. So we write blogs and post them typically over in the uh, education space. So let me jump back to the education space. And here I am, and you can see blogs in here. Here are Here's the whole education blog zone where you can see all kinds of blogs by Kylie and Joseph and our colleagues in the broader education team and some of our some of our faves from outside of the education zone. This is a this is a place where you're going to want to attend. You're going to want to jump into these zones because the GeoNet area is really, uh, this is where you can go, you can talk with other people that have interests, you can find groups to hang out in, you can find people that are using the tools that you're using, that are in the sort of the user community that you're in. And one of the communities that is in here is our T3G group, Teachers Teaching Teachers GIS. So when somebody says, hey, I just want to learn about helping others be able to do this. This is what we're all about in this zone. Teachers, teaching teachers, GIS. So explore virtual earth, uh, those, you know, access to the movies, GeoNet, this is the space to hang out in. That's what I wanted to show for my special collection of things. So now, we need to think about wrapping up here. We need to look at where we've been. Hours one through five, fundamentals. Hours six through 10, the expansions inside the, the core ArcGIS Online framework. And then hours 11 through 15, looking at the apps that are part of the school bundle that really expand your toolkit to be able to work with data collection and data analysis. Dashboard is such a powerful analytic tool. And then business analyst and community analyst to give you that tremendous research tools. And then our 16 through 20 story maps, what a powerful platform for telling the story of the work that you've been doing, the projects that you've been engaged in. How do you think about designing the activities, the research, the message, and laying it out there? And then, wow, as you've seen with these team faves, there's just so many other areas that are useful to go in and explore. Esri's mission is pretty simple to describe and challenging to do, but it's basically this. We build good tools to help people understand the world and solve problems, and then help people know why to use those tools, and then how to do that. And then we focus on helping all of these users who have our tools succeed in the things that they want to do, that you want to do. 
we want people to take advantage of these tools because we want people to solve problems, make good decisions. So when I'm doing teacher workshops, I have those goals, those ESRI goals, sort of as the base of everything that I do. And my little portion of the world, I do teacher workshops and institutes. And I always have three goals. And I want participants who come into those to understand why students should learn to use GIF. Why is it good? Hopefully, participating in this, you've seen all kinds of things that students can do for a long time. I also want people who come into the workshops to learn some basics. We wanted people to do that way back when it was much harder. Now, when we do a one hour workshop, we want people to do, to learn to do some basic things. And then to know how to learn more so that they leave a workshop and say, I know how I can, how I can get better, how I can do even more. This is my set of goals. I think Kylie and Joseph and Tom had a very similar set of goals. These are the things that drive us. We want students to understand what they can do. We need educators, we need parents who see these tools to say, God, my kids, our kids, our students need to learn these things. So let's, let's break that out a little bit. Why? Because you can learn classroom content and you can build skills for your future as a, as a person, for your future, for, you know, being a part of the community and for being somebody who is part of this big world that needs to make good decisions. We all need everybody to be making good decisions. Learning about the world is critical, but there's more to it than this. We need people to understand data, what it is, what somebody can do with it. Kylie talked about this today, about the data that she was working with and the parts that you can do with the data in our inside of arcade and and these elements that can be within the data joseph was working with data these photos that have geolocations attached to them you can take that data and create a map layer out of it it's learning what data is and what you can do with it and then if you get to do that you start to get to be a good consumer of data. You start to ask questions about the data. We need students to do that, to be critical consumers of data, to understand if this is being massaged in a certain way and does somebody have a reason that they're trying to massage it in that way. And then for them to be a responsible provider of the data. We need students to be critical thinkers and problem solvers. We desperately need that because we got a lot of challenges that we're facing. But we need people who are able to say all these different layers on the map, they're just, <clears throat> they're just a few of the layers that there could be. We need people to look at all of the layers to think about all of the ways that you can look at any particular topic or question or challenge. There are many ways of looking at all these things. We need people who will not just take that there's one way to see something. We'll look for all different sides. And sometimes that means being creative in how you do this. And when you when you think about a problem creatively, you may need to go off and be independent and look at some things and play with them for a while 
and you come up with an, a new way of presenting it, a new way of integrating these data layers. Sometimes you need to come back in and work with other people. You need to rely on somebody else's expertise about the data or the software or the presentation mode, and they need to rely on your experience, your background, your knowledge. We need people to communicate well. We need people to recognize their interdependence. And perhaps most of all, we need people who look at this and say, wow, there's new data and new tools all the time. I got to sit down and learn how to work with this one and with that and find these other things and see what other people are doing and how are they using this. And while you can solve that problem with the technique that they're using over here and being able to cope with new things that happen, like a pandemic that shuts down schools. How do we become good learners? Think about what it is that students could be doing in school with GIS. Learning that classroom content, building the skills. What is it that the world is going to be like a year from now? We don't know. We know that people who know how to adapt, that people who know how to work with data, and people who know how to solve problems, people who get practice doing that. As you practice that, you get better at it. That's, that's what we all need to rely on. We all need to rely on students building these skills, expressing them in their life, and for decades to come, and adults who can learn right alongside with the students. We got to rely on that. So, if you jump back into this last episode, there's a whole bank of items to explore arcade, the resources the using photos with locations, the zip code lookup, the GIS career movies, Python, Explorer and Earth. Ah, gosh, how did both of them get in there? And GeoNet and T3G. And then our friends in other places and our colleagues in the larger education team who help us build these resources organize them, assemble them, create them, make them available to everybody so that everybody can take advantage of these things. These are here for you to take advantage of from now on. We want people to use these things. And last, we're all here just to say thank you for being with us. Thank you for being on this journey. We look forward to seeing what you do, seeing what your kids do, what your students do. Send us a note, share, post online, make maps, and solve problems. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye.